Good morning, all of you. After a very nice evening, certainly for the speakers and the chairs and the organizers, uh, yesterday evening, thank you, Palos, and thank you, team, again, for presenting us such a wonderful evening. Uh, we start again, 9 o'clock in the morning, uh, and, and we expect that some people will come in rather uh, a bit later when the coffee is ready. Uh, we are here with uh, four experts. Unfortunately, only two are here sitting on my side. Uh, the other two will be online, and I already have to announce that there might be a bit of a technical problem in some delay between the vision and the sound. So bear with us that it might go a little bit more comp uh, difficult than, than, than it uh, sh sometimes is with Zoom. Uh, I want to start again also with congratulating Panos. And, and as, as, uh, as colleagues, Panos was with us when he started the whole project on uh, the, 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 trying to work on the interpretation of uh, customary international law, trying to apply for ERC grants. And I still remember that when he, for the first time, came up with that idea. And I read it, I said, mm, this is not going to get any chance to get being, it's not a f sexy topic. And it is, uh, I, I think, it'll never get through the, the, the selection round. Amazingly, he got through. And it has become a very valuable uh, project, I think, not only because of what has done in tricky law, but also all the things around it, uh, the, the, the ILA study group, which was uh, established, uh, but also for Groningen University, having this group, the tricky law group. It did a lot to our group in international law, but in the faculty in, 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 all, in, in, in total. So it is a very interesting. A lot of outcomes, a lot of workshops, a lot of uh, conferences like this. Uh, and we will have soon then the draft articles, conclusions, guidelines, whatever. So that will be a lasting contribution to international. Congratulations, panels and team. And I, I also wanted to stress the way how everything is finished in time, not only the study group in the ILA, but also this project now with this final conference, but also the PhDs who have been working there. We have the Nina who just defended her PhD and where is uh, uh, Marina, she's there sitting next week. She's going to defend the PhD. So that's also worth uh, an extra compliment that you have achieved that all within the available time. But let's not talk too much. We have a very interesting topic today, modern challenges and approaches. And I think that's important. And I was also inspired by the talk by Celine yesterday. And I had also something about interpretation of customary international law. It, it raises a lot of uh, questions for especially new areas where we're not talking only about rules between states so much and obligations, but where we talk about governance issues, where we have these common interests, global interests, and where we have to manage them rather than work only on particular rules. Huh? So the ongoing work, like in the committees, as, as Celine uh, uh, yesterday explained, that is very important, and I think the topics for today, the law of the sea, outer space law, um, <coughs> responsibility, that's also something where there's a lot of uh, developments going on. EU law, uh, I think they are very topical to see how interpretation of customary international law fits into these very difficult and modern times. So let's listen and let's have a discussion. We will start with, I don't know whether she's already there, Patricia. Um, Patricia uh, galvao Teles from Portugal, she is joining us online. I don't see her. Uh, Conrad, I hope that she was able to hear me. Yeah. And then we will move to the, uh, to the front seat so that we can see her as well. Yes, well, good morning to all. Um, I am very sorry I'm not in Athens, and especially after, after having heard the introduction by Marcel and the reference to the dinner last night, I'm even more sorry that I'm not able uh, to join you in person, but I still thought that uh, the topic of this conference was so interesting and thought-provoking, uh, and I very much appreciated the explanation about the project by Marcel now that I couldn't resist in, uh, in participating even if it wasn't mine. And I also wanted to congratulate uh, the organizers of the conference and, um, 
and uh, indeed with so many colleagues, very dear colleagues and friends, both in the organization and, um, and, and as uh, speakers, I'm even more sorry not to, to have joined you in Athens. But uh, um, let me speak to you as, as Marcel said, I'm going to speak to you and try to, to it's, it's really a collective uh, brainstorming exercise, the spirit of my presentation, uh, to discuss the importance and utility of festival international law interpretation uh, in the context of sea level rise. And of course, sea level rise fits very well this, uh, the topic of this panel. Uh, which is the interpretation of customary international law um, uh, as applied to modern challenges. And certainly uh, sea level rise as one of the uh, adverse impacts of uh, climate change is a modern challenge and it's uh, a challenge that poses um, difficulties not only from the point of view of uh, um, uh, states taking adaptation and, med uh, and, 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 uh, and other types of uh, mitigation measures, but also uh, it poses legal uh, challenges. And uh, those legal challenges, uh, as some of you may know, um, have been the subject of intense um, study, both by the uh, International Law Association, and, and Marcel knows that very well uh, also, uh, the International Association has created a committee uh, to deal with the issue of uh, sea level rise and international law. And then after um, that work started at the International Law Association, uh, the International Law Commission has also um, uh, decided to put the topic of sea level rise uh, in relation to international law uh, on its agenda. Um, in the format of a study group, um, and I'm uh, one of the co-chairs of the study group, and of course I'm also a member of the ILA committee, um, and um, the study group was mandated to do a mapping of the legal issues uh, related to sea level rise uh, in three main areas. Uh, one related to law of the sea, uh, the other one related to um, statehood, and then the other one related to the protection of persons affected by sea level rise. Um, and I'm going to um, discuss this, especially focusing more, uh, although I mean, of course, I'm happy also in the discussion period, and I appreciate uh, to get some uh, feedback or questions or comments right after my presentation, because I have to go and teach a class at my university. Uh, right after this panel, but um, I'm going to focus more, um, not not so much on the law of the sea uh, part, but uh, more on the statehood and the protection of persons area, because uh, those are the areas that I'm following more closely. Uh, I did a report with uh, my colleague uh, Juan Jose Buda Santolaria uh, last year uh, on uh, statehood and protection of persons. And, and I'm uh, indeed the one that has the responsibility on the part of protection of persons. So it's also, I think, uh, the, this topic of uh, the um, uh, importance and uh, utility of interpretation of customary international law uh, with regard to those uh, uh, specific uh, subtopics and, and uh, really uh, raised some, uh, some issues uh, for me and, and made me think. Uh, and, and and that's why I was also so interested and curious, um, and I hope to stay uh, until the end of the panel so to, to hear the other presentation. So one of, one of the things that I was thinking when I was reading uh, the, um, the papers that Panos uh, shared, uh, both on the background of the study, but I, I'm still digesting the, uh, the um, draft articles uh, and the commentaries uh, that were circulated uh, more recently, and, and, and I, I, my immediate uh, comment or reaction would be to say, and also having um, uh, having worked on um, uh, on on the customary international law uh, topic in the ILC, because I was uh, already a member when uh, the Commission was finalizing the topic on the second reading. 
Um, my, my initial reaction, my first thought is that uh, um, it, it, it's hard to separate identification from interpretation. I think that would be my, my, first, um, my first issue that I think we have to um, think about how, you know, when to speak about interpretation, how, how do we separate identification from, uh, uh, from uh, uh, interpretation? Because when I was looking at the sea level rise topic and at the subtopics and trying to, you know, think what, what can we say about the, uh, the, 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 the importance and the utility, um, I was uh, especially uh, thinking that, uh, you know, we always end up by using the identification elements also for the interpretation. So it's very interesting that um, it is mentioned, and it's mentioned in, in, the, in the articles that were produced in the context of this project, uh, that, that, that we, for the interpretation, we has, also have to look at the, the basis for the formation of the customary international law rule. And in a lot of instances, uh, those will be treaties, um, because there's this very intense um, interaction between treaties and customary international law. So there will almost always be a written basis also for the interpretation of customary international law, because uh, there will be treaties, there will be resolutions of uh, the UN General Assembly, there will be soft law instruments. So um, it, it's, I think, and those are the ones, of course, those elements are the ones that are used also for the identification uh, of the two elements, both the practice and the, and the opinion theory. So um, I'm, I'm not sure how much we can distinguish, um, but I think that's the question about this, uh, this work, uh, the identification from the, from the interpretation, because uh, we have to interpret also the, uh, the written basis on which the customary international law Appear. And for example, if I'm, I'm thinking, and in particular, and now moving to concrete examples, I chose three examples that we're looking at from the point of view of um, uh, statehood, the possible disappearance of states in the context of sea level rise, which uh, might occur, and um, not with every state that is affected, but of course in the most extreme uh, cases, uh, especially in the Pacific Islands, and, and when I was thinking also about the protection of persons' issues, you know, what would be areas where it would make sense to discuss the interpretation uh, of customary international law and its importance and utility? And so I, I just, just um, out of um, an exercise again of, uh, of uh, trying to brainstorm this uh, with this audience, uh, I thought I would focus on three um, examples, one from the statehood part and uh, two others from uh, the protection of persons part. And so uh, when we speak about uh, the uh, statehood, uh, one of the issues that we discussed in, uh, in our second issues paper, and it was also discussed in the context of the ILA committee, is whether there is a presumption of continuity of statehood. Um, because I, uh, there have been, you know, in, in, except for the cases of state succession, where you may have uh, political reasons why um, a state will change um, a legal personality in the sense that it was a bigger state that then uh, uh, um, uh, turns um, and disintegrates and turns into several states, or you have uh, a process of a merger of, of states as you've had in, in the past, um, it, it's uh, a new phenomenon. That's why this uh, topic comes into the heading of uh, modern challenges. And certainly it would be a new phenomenon for a, a state to disappear as a legal person, not because of political change, but because of uh, loss of territory, disappearance of territory. And the physical territory of the state would become submerged and underwater due to sea level rise. And so uh, we are looking uh, to um, customer international law, of course, um, um, including based on uh, uh, the, um, and I see that there is, 
Uh, I'm not sure if this is going on, but I'll, I'll continue speaking because I, as, as Marcel said, that there's some delay. But uh, um, we, we are looking in particular to the Montevideo Convention, um, uh, which certainly uh, is um, the basis uh, for the formation of uh, the customary, customary norms for um, uh, the creation um, of statehood and recognition of statehood. Um, but when we try to interpret that, and, and that's the point about the interpretation uh, of uh, customary international law and, and looking at uh, and, you know, one convention that is uh, almost 100, year old, 100 years old and uh, has been used, uh, not necessarily because states are party to that convention, but as, as a form of reflection of the views of uh, the international community in terms of the creation of states. Um, and there is really nothing against um, uh, or, or no criteria for the cessation of states or the disappearance of states. And so the issue here is whether can we interpret this as being um, in, in the sense of uh, the uh, perception of continuity of statehood. That perhaps here we have a dimension of interpretation of customary international law. Um, the other, the other two examples, the other two examples are from the protection of persons um, affected by sea level rise, which is also the human rights migration dimension part, which is the one that I'm looking for and uh, detail. Uh, and, and in terms, there's one point in terms of uh, human rights obligations, um, uh, because of course, uh, human rights uh, treaties, uh, they were not concluded. Uh, when we think about the two covenants and, and other human rights treaties, even the refugee convention of 1951, they were not concluded having in mind the possibility that uh, uh, the enjoyment of human rights could be affected uh, by this new phenomenon of climate change, and in particular the phenomena of uh, um, uh, sea level rise that clearly uh, can uh, affect the enjoyment of a number of human rights from economic and social and cultural rights, like the right to housing and the right to education and the right to health, and, and also the right to enjoyment in terms of the cultural life um, and cultural traditions, but also it could affect also when uh, there are situations of risk, um, a right, the right to life and the right not to uh, be subject to torture and, and degrading treatment. And so there's a very important uh, case from uh, the Human Rights uh, Committee, uh, the case uh, um, uh, of uh, Tetiota against New Zealand, uh, where the Human Rights Committee, um, although it did not consider that the situations in terms of risk um, uh, to uh, and the right to life and to the uh, prohibition for torture and human and degrading treatment were uh, already there, were already met. Um, but it gave a time span of about 15 years, and this was already a couple of years back. So um, uh, soon, according to this position of the Human Rights uh, um, uh, Committee, uh, there would be a real risk to the enjoyment of these human rights. And so when that is the case, uh, there is uh, the issue of uh, the uh, obligation of uh, non refoulement and non kicking And of course, uh, the non refoulement principle is a principle especially from uh, refugee law, but also contained in uh, human rights treaties, and it's been recognized as a customary international law norm, the obligation of states not to um, uh, refugee, to uh, return uh, people uh, to their home countries if there is a risk to their life or to um, of, of having a risk of being tortured or having to, su to sustain a human and degrading treatment. So this uh, obligation of no reform now, which is basically an obligation and that can be grounded on customary international law, um, could be interpreted, could be interpreted also to cover uh, these new cases of um, uh, situations of people uh, that uh, are facing the challenge of uh, sea level rise uh, back in their home countries and therefore uh, the state where they are could not return them back to their country. So that's another example where we could try to think how to interpret this rule that was um, even you know, as a customary uh, rule uh, emerging in, in other instances but apply it also to this case. 
Um, and there's a uh, one one last example that I would also use, um, and and I'm, I'm mindful also of the time. One last example that I would also use. Um, that it's it's it, it's uh, probably covering uh, both uh, the statehood and the protection of persons um, and part, uh, which is a, an important aspect I think of what would be uh, any uh, legal regime that could be put in place for the protection of persons affected by sea level rise, and it, which is the issue of um, international cooperation, the general duty of international cooperation. Um, and how um, uh, states, um, uh, both the affected states, um, uh, should be seen to have a duty to seek assistance. Um, and, and that's something that the ILC has also discussed in the context of a, a, a topic that was completed uh, already some years ago, the topic of protection of persons in the event of disasters where the ILC discussed the customer international law principle of states to uh, and uh, the duty uh, regarding the duty to uh, seek assistance uh, when uh, there is an immediate uh, danger for their population and 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 I would even take it a step further um, uh, to discuss whether this principle of international cooperation which is formulated in very broad terms in treaty law and also in uh, resolutions of international organizations and also in some um, regional and bilateral treaties, whether that, um, that principle of international co cooperation should apply not only or should tra be translated uh, as a matter of uh, customer international law not only in a duty to seek assistance from the affected states, but also in a duty to consider offering assistance from the part of third states. And so I think there's also room for trying to seize and interpret um, customary international law and to apply it to these new challenges. And so I think that's the, also the interesting part about the, um, uh, the exercise that is proposed by the studies to try to um, allow for customer international law through its interpretation uh, to cater to modern challenges and rather than propose necessarily the creation of uh, new rules. So I, I would end here my, my presentation and I'm, I'm very happy if there's any questions or comments. And then of course, as Marcel say, I'll stay until your Thank you very much for your attention and I hope it was um, okay, the transmission, because I also uh, can hear the feedback. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Patricia, for these very relevant examples of what problems are caused by all these new changes and how the existing rules are insufficient to, 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 to deal with these and how we can wor work on that. I don't know how the delay will work out, but are there any questions here for this moment for Patricia in the room? Yes, I see there, Alessandra. Hi, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I was wondering uh, whether um, you have taken into consideration how much uh, it is a matter, and I understand you are just uh, um, asking this question yourself, but how much is a question of interpretation and how much is it the question of analogy? I mean, applying the existing customary rules by analogy to a different uh, uh, set of facts, maybe? Uh, just wondering. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, uh, Professor Tellis, for this very interesting uh, presentation. Um, I had a question uh, basically prompted by... Shall I wait for the second question, Marcel? Yeah, prompted by your... Uh, yes, but it's already started. It's sentence. Uh, I, I, I keep keep on speaking so that there is no gap. Um, uh, that basically uh, what, what you suggest is ways that uh, these interpretations could apply to yeah, modern right. challenges. Right. 
um, rather than creating uh, new rules. And uh, I completely agree, and this is a fundamental tenet of the, of the tricky law project. My question would be uh, that even if, if one suggests that or goes down that, that direction, uh, what do you think from your experience uh, would be potentially the pushback from, from, from the states themselves? Uh, do you think that this would be something that they would be more amenable, open, open to? Or even in this case, uh, where you try and apply existing rules in modern kind of situations, the states themselves would still be potentially reluctant to accept such a, such a direction, such an approach. Thank you very much. Please go ahead, Patricia, with your answers. So I'll just continue. So thank you so much for for the questions, and 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 I think we're all really on the same um, uh, um, uh, in, in in the same wavelength in terms of uh, the, the questions that you asked were also questions that I was also um, asking myself. I mean, in particular, the first one about interpretation or analogy. Um, because I was thinking, yes, indeed, I think what we're trying to do um, is interpreting by analogy, so using existing rules, applying them the practice of to uh, um, similar situations, but that were not foreseen um, at the time those uh, rules emerged uh, as, um, as customary international law. Um, but, but I think for me, I would see the analogy also as part of the interpretation. Again, I'm not sure if it's useful to have very strict boundaries between interpretation and, 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 and application by analogy, because I think they are probably part of the, uh, of the same um, exercise. But I was uh, really, when I was thinking about these examples, I was thinking, yeah, indeed, probably what we're doing is that we're applying them uh, by by analogy, or at least extending the application, uh, the, the interpretation to apply them in this uh, similar situations that were not the original situations that were uh, foreseen, uh, both uh, either when the treaties were being negotiated or when they emerged also as customary international law uh, norms. And and then on on the second question. Um, I would think. I mean, it depends. I would. I would say um, um, it. It really depends on the interpretation you offer. Because if it's a good inter interpretation, uh, if it is a correct one, and, and if it's one that makes sense, um, and I think it's uh, likely that states would accept it. And uh, uh, we are already seeing some examples of that. I said I would not speak in the initial part about the law and the sea uh, part because it's not the one the area that I'm working directly on. But I think we have a good example in the um, uh, also from the law of the sea part where uh, the interpretation that is being proposed of bank laws um, and so not new rules, not the creation of new rules, but the interpretation of bank laws uh, in the sense that states are, are not required. Uh, to once they've deposited their uh, um, uh, charts in accordance with the convention, uh, they're not required to upgrade them. And I think this is being an interpretation that is being well received by um, states and even uh, the subject of uh, a declaration, a very important declaration by the Pacific Island Forum states. Uh, which has had um, uh, support also from AOSIS, and also from the US, also from Japan. And so I think if, if, the, if, uh, if there is um, um, a good uh, justification and explanation of the interpretation, um, and states uh, can accept it. And, and certainly I would say, I mean, of course, dramatizing a bit, but I think anything is easier than creating new rules at this point. I think it's very difficult to create, uh, especially when we think about treaty uh, rules, uh, it's very difficult to create those at the, at this point. So I think the root of interpretation um, that is solidly grounded um, uh, on, on the existing rules, be it treaty law or customary international law, and uh, has the potential to be uh, accepted by the states. I'm not saying any interpretation, not any interpretation, 
and of course there could be interpretations that could be considered too far reaching by states but uh, the interpretations that are uh, grounded solidly uh, on existing law and, and that are balanced and also help uh, in resolving uh, these new issues without the need to create new law, I think um, uh, there's, there's a chance that they will be accepted by states and the example that we see uh, in the law of the sea area is, is, is a good example of that. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Patricia. And even will, while there will be some delay before she hears this, let's give her a big applause. <laughs> Thank you for being with us and sharing your thoughts about these modern challenges. It, it, it shows both that it is an, a, 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 an abstract topic, but also that it is uh, uh, relevant for many people's and, and her, their lives. So. Thank you so much. We will move on to the next uh, speaker. Uh, we don't have time for the chat uh, questions at this moment. Uh, so I, I would invite the both panelists, or at least Georges, um, let me say it correctly, Kyriakopoulos, to the floor to make his presentation on a completely different area, but also just as intriguing, the developments there, that is uh, on the space law aspects. Thank you. You have Okay. So, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. Uh, we continue this discussion on particular issues of interpretation in the context of international customary law, and I think now is the time to <coughs> submit some thoughts on uh, uh, whether there is or not interpretation in the context of <coughs> space law, and in particular, in the context of okay. in the context of uh, <coughs> uh, what we could call as customary uh, international space law. Uh, for those of you that uh, you are not so familiar with. Okay. With space law. Uh, just a few words, sort of introduction. Uh, it is a branch of international law that mainly uh, regulates relations of states, not only, but also mainly, and in the beginning at least, originally, state-to-state -state relations with regard to outer space. And uh, it is a relatively new branch of international law as everything started back in 1957 um, when the first ever artificial satellite was put into orbit by the then Soviet Union. It was Sputnik, the first Sputnik, that started all this uh, uh, space uh, uh, adventure of humankind. And uh, <clears throat> uh, it is not surprising if you take into consideration that space law was mainly developed uh, in the context of the Cold War. And uh, um, in the middle of the confrontation between the then two superpowers, uh, the United States and the Soviet Union, that uh, uh, <clears throat> the core of space law still today reflects the international relations of the Cold War era. And of course, uh, it is um, uh, a product of a compromise at the legal level between the two superpowers at that time. Um, however, ironically, but uh, 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 it's not bad for us lawyers, scholars, that this confrontation of the two superpowers in space led to the achievement of a revolutionary branch of international law, an optimal balance between their interests, and uh, um, the fundamental principles that were uh, formed at that time and are still valid today in the beginning contained in the famous resolution 1962 of 1963, in fact, a declaration on uh, space law principles, uh, uh, reflect uh, uh, a law that, uh, uh, in essence, uh, uh, recognizes no sovereignty for states uh, in outer space, and has also some other important uh, uh, fundamental principles, such as, for instance, the prohibition of weapons of mass destruction in outer space. But <coughs> uh, let's start a little our discussion about custom. 
there is custom in, in space law, and in fact, this uh, was created in a very short time. This is why Bin Cheng uh, uh, talked about instant custom. Because uh, since 1957 up to 1962, is only six or seven years, we have a series of resolutions of the United Assembly, uh, General Assembly of the United Nations. You can see them there. Uh, the most important of them is the red one. The red one is <coughs> 1962 of 1963. It is the first ever uh, uh, inclusion in a text, in an instrument of the fundamental principles of space law. And after four years, these principles were codified in the 1967 Outer Space Treaty. Uh, you can see in this slide the most important of, of these principles. There are also other. But uh, uh, just to give you an example, and you see with flashes, with arrows, in which articles of the Outer Space Treaty, these principles were codified. And we accept today that the Outer Space Law principles uh, have acquired, since that time, a customary status. Uh, just to point out, uh, exploration and use of outer space uh, shall be carried on for the benefit of in the interest of all mankind. Um, okay, okay, it's, it's a little bit awkward, all that. Okay. Look at uh, um, number three, for instance, that outer space and the celestial bodies are not subject to national appropriation by claim of sovereignty, by means of use or occupation, or by any other means. Finally, uh, codified in Article 2 of the Outer Space Treaty. Keep that in mind because it will be useful for our discussion after some slides. Um, and for instance, that look at the number six, that uh, um, when states exploring and use outer space um, shall conduct activities up there, uh, having due regard for the corresponding interests of other states. And this is why they should enter in consultations when they plan an activity that potentially can have a harmful interference over activities of other states. Uh, <clears throat> entering now um, in the customary dimension of these principles, uh, let me remind you uh, conclusion 11 of the ILC draft conclusions of, on the identification of customary international law, 2018 that uh, uh, a rule set forth in a treaty may reflect a rule of customary international law if it is established that the treaty rule codified a rule of customary international law existing at the time when the treaty was concluded. This is exactly the case with all these principles of space law. The Outer Space Treaty codified the series of customary principles. No one denies that today. It is unanimously accepted that these principles had acquired the customary status since the 60s. Uh, here you can see the conventional framework, the five space treaties. The most important, of course, is the first one, the 1967 of the space treaty, whereas the last one, the fifth, the Moon Agreement of 1979, a good agreement but very poorly ratified as only, it is in force, of course, but only 19 states have ratified thus far. So uh, the fact is that another discussion uh, uh, related to uh, the existence of custom in, in, in international space relations comes from the fact that since the 1979 and the Moon Agreement, we have no other treaties. The international space community has become allergic to treaties, so there is a lot of soft law. And um, an important and interesting discussion is whether we can already uh, evaluate that customary rules have emerged from these soft law instruments. The most important of this soft law a text, uh, you can see them here, uh, principles for artificial earth, um, uh, artificial earth satellites for direct television broadcasting, remote sensing, nuclear power sources, and the most important is the fourth one, space debris mitigation guidelines. And why is that? Because a significant number of scholars 
believe today that this soft law instrument, the space debris mitigation guidelines have already crossed the threshold of customary law as uh, they have been uniformly applied uh, by the major national space agencies, by the Americans, Russians, Chinese, Japanese, etc., and of course by the European Space Agency. So there's a strong belief, conviction, that um, these principles uh, are already customary law. So in this context, uh, I would like to present you two different examples of how this uh, discussion on in interpretation of customary law can have an impact on space law. First case, with respect to the space derby mitigation guidelines, all is clear. You understand what I mean by that. You see here, for instance, two of these guidelines. There are eight. Uh, take a look at the first one. Space systems should be designed not to release debris during normal operations. If this is not feasible, the effect of any release of debris on the outer space environment should be minimized. It's very clear. The text of a technical nature, it is very clear, in fact. So, uh, we can say that with respect to these principles that were so marvelously uh, um, uh, applied by all space fairness states uh, does not pose any issues of interpretation. Uh, the scope for an interpretative approach to the customary rules derived from these guidelines is very limited. And I think this is due to the fact that although the shell of the rules in question is certainly legal, soft law, of course, but by no means legal, their substantive content is technical. And states agree on these technical dimensions. So no field for interpretation thus far. Second example, the non-appropriation principle, customary principle, uh, but also codified in Article 2 of the Outer Space Treaty. This is a good example of how attempting to, in to interpret can lead to negating the substance of the rule. And why is that? You see the text of Article 2. Outer space, including the moon and the other celestial bodies, is not subject to national appropriation by claim of sovereignty by means of user occupation by any, by any other means. This is exactly the, the essence of the customary principle. Uh, so the non-appropriation principle exists both at the conventional and the customary level. And it is generally accepted in doctrine. We have no objections on that that the concept of appropriation refers to both states and individuals. So, however, in recent years, there is a controversial practice of some space-faring states, many of the United States, that uh, can produce a very important discussion as far as interpretation is concerned. See a little the different positions that U.S. administration uh, has taken and uh, on the occasion of the Gregory Nemitz claims. Gregory Nemitz was an individual uh, that claimed uh, uh, pop property rights on an asteroid. There was a clear response by U.S. authorities that this is out of question because of Article 2. And you can see the text here. This is the official text of the Department of State. Uh, and you can read very clearly that uh, in the view of the department, private ownership of an asteroid is precluded by Article 2. This was a very clear position at that time. But things changed. And in 2015, the United States introduced the famous Space Competitiveness Act in the context of which we can read that uh, a United States citizen shall be entitled to any asteroid resource or space resource obtained, including to possess, own, transport, use, and sell the asteroid resource, which is something clearly in violation of both the customary and the conventional dimensions of the non-appropriation principle. And then after some years, 
uh, during the Trump administration, 2020, there was an executive order of the president um, at the same direction, according to which Americans should have the right to engage in commercial exploration, recovery, and use of resources in outer space. Last but not least in this series of uh, uh, shifting American practice, in US practice, the Artemis Accords. The Artemis Accords are a non-binding, in, in fact, it's just one, non-binding multilateral agreement that uh, have been proposed by the United States and uh, already uh, they have been signed on a bilateral basis by 20 other, uh, 28 other states. Uh, maybe there are some more up today. This is the number of August 1st. You can see also the states that have signed the Artemis Accords. It is, it is an agreement with noble inspirations, many good words, but the most important thing in that is Article 10. Because in Article 10, we can discover an alternative interpretation of Article 2 both of the customary principle and the treaty principle. And we can read that the signatories affirm that the extraction of space resources does not inherently constitute national appropriation under Article 2 of the Outer Space Treaty, and that contracts and other legal instruments relating to space resources should be consistent with that treaty. So it is crucial that uh, the potential proliferation of contracting states in the future in the Artemis Accords would give them this interpretation of Article 2 a customary force. So, and I have almost closed, Chair. Uh, let me remind you, in order to close and conclude another of the draft conclusions of ILC 2018, that uh, conclusion 11 a rule set forth in a treaty may reflect the rule of customary international law if it is established that the treaty rule, point C, has given a rise to a general practice that is accepted as law, opinion juris, thus generating a new rule of customary international law. And I think this is exactly what the United States tried to do through time with the progressive proliferation of states that sign on a bilateral base, bilateral basis the Artemis Accords to create an alternative interpretation of Article 2 that, in fact, goes against the essence of the rule. And as a conclusion, uh, in the context of space law, the landscape in which attempts to interpret the relevant customary rules, which in this law are largely at the level of principles, still we do not have detailed rules, may or may not emerge is rich and varied. The emergence of customary rules of a technical nature will not give rise to problems of interpretation. And we have many such rules in space law. Uh, because of the clarity of technical rules. On the contrary, in those areas where certain states are tacitly seeking to overturn the existing international legal framework, both conventional and customary, uh, subversive interpretations will be made with the ultimate aim of creating new customary rules, which through the progressive spread of this heretical practice will effectively abolish the existing framework through time, of course, and if states will help on that. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Thank you very much uh, for enlightening us on a topic which not many people are very much familiar with, the, uh, the, the, what happens in the, in the area of uh, space law. And I think it partly also answered the question yesterday, is there any practical relevance to interpretation of, of, of Kashmir international law? Here we see clearly how it can be very relevant. Uh, let's move immediately, and I hope that we can have Professor Jan Wouters uh, on screen. Thank you. Uh, good morning, dear colleagues. Um, my sincere apologies that I cannot be live with you. I would like to start by congratulating Panos and his team for this great conference, not just for this great conference, but also for the great work under this ERC project, and also for these uh, wonderful draft articles which you have made, and which really read like uh, an ILC document that is meant to be a compliment. And so let's immediately dive 
into the subject matter. My paper looks into the practice of the European Union with regard to customary international law. I will first focus on the case law of the European Court of Justice, but then I will also try to contrast that with uh, the practice of other and notably the legislative institutions of the European Union. Um, and I should, uh, of course, start by uh, saying something about the specific uh, context of the European Union uh, as an uh, organization of a, of a special kind, but also as an international uh, subject of law. Uh, as you may know, the European Court of Justice, already in the milestone cases, Van Gent and Loos, Costa versus Enel in the early 1960s, developed European community law, as it was called then, into an autonomous legal order, uh, which is distinct, as the court said, from ordinary international law and ordinary international uh, treaties. And I should say uh, that emphasis on autonomy of the community legal order uh, basically made that for many years the European Court of Justice uh, really uh, shied away from making any reference or accepting any argument based upon customary international law. And there is a great variety of cases where practitioners tried to bring customary law into the court's practice, notably in antitrust cases. It all failed until in 1998 we saw an opening with the so-called racket case, where the court for the first time accepted that an individual racket, a, a German, um, say, a, a German wine uh, seller, could invoke the customary rule of Regus six Tantibus as um, a, a ground to challenge the validity of a council decision that unilaterally terminated um, the um, uh, then existing uh, trade agreement between the old EEC and the former uh, Yugoslavia. I won't go in the racket case here. I will rather go a little bit in the evolution of the case law because uh, that sign of openness became a bit less open, was relativized in uh, later case law. Um, that's one thing. The other uh, preliminary remark, as you all know, the European Union is a very special international actor. Uh, it is definitely not a state. It is uh, definitely not an ordinary international organization. It is something in between, which itself has uh, concluded hundreds of both bilateral and multilateral agreements. It's a very prolific treaty actor. It also is very active in a great number of international organizations, from the WTO in Geneva to the UN uh, in New York and Geneva and many other places, where it makes constantly uh, references uh, in its statements to the respect of international law. And importantly, the EU also has a worldwide diplomatic uh, network. Um, and so already to all these ways of engaging in the international legal order, the EU is of course using customary international law. And for instance, in its diplomatic relations with third countries, it cannot use directly the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations, but it basically uses, let's say, the customary version of the Vienna uh, Convention. That's one thing. On the other hand, uh, we could say the European Union, through its very widespread practice, especially in the area of exclusive powers like trade policy and the trade agreements it makes, um, is itself an important actor in customary law. That has been explicitly recognized um, in, in the work of the ILC uh, uh, with the special rapporteur Michael Wood on, um, say, uh, customary international law. Now let me turn to the case law of the European Court of Justice. Um, one last kind of preliminary remark is about the EU treaties themselves, which um, before 14 years, before the Treaty of Lisbon took effect, did not really say anything about the relationship between the EU and, and international law. That has changed in the sense that in the Treaty of Lisbon one finds various references to um, international law. And uh, the strongest one, which has also been picked up in the case law of the European Court of Justice in the ATAA case, 
is that Article 3, Paragraph 5 of the Treaty on European Union uh, stre uh, stresses the European Union's commitment to promote um, um, the strict observance of international law, contribute to the strict observance and development of international law. It's a, it's a great quote, and the Court of Justice in the ATAA case has basically interpreted this to mean that whenever the EU adopts an act, it is bound to observe international law in its entirety, including customary international law, end of quote. So in other words, the court has interpreted that rather generic uh, reference in Article 3, Paragraph 5 of the TEU as meaning that the Union must respect international law uh, and all forms and all sources of international law, including customary rules, in the exercise of its powers. As such, that's not a new statement. Already back in 1991, in the so-called Poulsen case, the European Court had, in a way, confirmed that principle. But now it can link it to the treaty framework of the Lisbon uh, Treaty. Okay. Now, how does the uh, Court of Justice do that? Um, <clears throat> the Court has uh, indeed uh, confirmed that the Union is bound by customary international law. And it is interesting to see the various ways in which the Court uses customary rules uh, for different purposes. Um, there is case law in which the Court basically uses uh, customary rules to act as a limit on the exercise of powers of member states or of the EU, for instance, the law of the sea cases. Um, there are many other cases where the court uses customary international law as rules of interpretation. And of course, the first one here is the Vienna Convention uh, on the Law of Treaties, which, as you know, is not something the EU is a party, cannot be a party, it's only open to states. But as you know, the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties is largely seen as part of customary international law today, and the Court of Justice very frequently refers to the rules of the Vienna Convention uh, uh, to interpret international agreements the EU is a party to. Thirdly, interestingly, uh, sometimes the Court of Justice uses uh, customary rules as a kind of gap filler in case there is no ready um, EU law available. Um, so, and then last but not least, uh, and that's of course the most, um, let's say, far-reaching use of customary rules, I give the example already of the racket case, where the Court of Justice essentially used the rebus substantibus customary international treaty law doctrine to um, basically check the legality of an EU act, an act of the Council of Ministers. That's of course the most far-reaching uh, use. Now what we see here, um, is that after racket, in a number of later cases, including ATAA, including Intertanko, the Court of Justice has, in a way, yeah, backtracked a little bit its enthusiasm for customary international law. It has, in a way, developed a test um, uh, in various conditions to which customary rules must um, comply in order for them to be able to be invoked by individuals to challenge um, the validity of EU uh, acts. What has the court said? Well, it says, first of all, um, rules of customary law that uh, an individual invokes must be capable of calling into question the competence of the union to adopt that act. Secondly, they must be liable to affect rights which the individual in question derives from European Union law or to create obligations under European Union law in that respect. And so, in a way, that test is far more restrictive than uh, what the U Court of Justice has developed with regard to the possibility to use international agreements to which the EU is a party as uh, a weapon against the validity of certain secondary acts of the EU. How does the court justify this differentiated um, approach to customary international law. Interestingly, the court says that, um, yeah, a principle, and I quote from a case, the principle of customary international law does not have the same degree of precision as a provision of an international agreement. That's what it says in the ADAA case. 
I refer now quickly to uh, the draft articles, uh, the great draft articles which have been communicated to us by Thanos, where indeed at a certain moment also the draft articles speak about the more the inherently more abstract or general nature of customary international law. Doesn't necessarily mean imprecise, but the court is basically saying that yes, because those rules are a bit vaguer, more imprecise than treaty rules, um, it's um, kind of a test to uh, judge the validity of uh, EU acts based on customary law uh, will require it to only limit itself to so-called manifest errors. Um, so the standard of review is um, that uh, yeah, uh, only when there is a manifest violation of a rule of customary law that then, um, say, the court will strike down that rule. Together with those two other conditions, it means that it almost never will happen. Um, and uh, again, the court refers to justify this uh, marginal kind of appreciation, manifest error test. It refers to that uh, for that purpose to the complexity of the rules in question and the imprecision of some of the concept concepts to which they uh, refer. That was already stated like that in uh, the lucky case. And so, yes, the court takes this view that customary law is imprecise and that, therefore, only manifest errors of assessment in um, the legislative acts of the EU can be subject to that um, test under customary international uh, law. I personally have never agreed with this um, hands-offish um, view and approach of customary law. The notion that customary rules are less precise than treaty law are, in my view, that notion is questionable. Um, we can have a long discussion about that, but some treaty provisions, if you think, for instance, on the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, are not necessarily more detailed or uh, more clear and unambiguous than certain um, the rules of customary international law. So I, I do question this attitude to customary law as being uh, necessarily imprecise or more imprecise than uh, treaty uh, but so, yes, in that sense, uh, the court's attitude to customary international law is a bit uh, puzzling. On the one hand, we now know that since RACA there is a certain openness to customary law, even uh, um, in the end as a tool to possibly challenge the validity of secondary acts of the EU. On the other hand, uh, in light of what I told you, the later case law, it is clear that the court's um, use of customary law is very uh, restrictive, more restrictive than with regard to international agreements. Now, if I may, uh, dear myself, I would like to contrast that with the attitude of the EU legislature, because indeed, when we talk about practice under customary international law, it's not just the court of justice, it's very important, but there is, of course, also the other EU institutions and bodies. In the final paper, uh, I would hope to uh, not just deal with the Council uh, of the EU, but also with the Parliament, uh, with the Commission, with the External Action Service, to see how they deal with customary international law. But I should already say that, um, um, also based on earlier research, I found out that the general attitude of the EU lawmaker, uh, the EU legislator, to uh, international law is actually more open and uh, more, um, say, uh, less restrictive than the approach of the European Court of Justice. You see that in uh, quite a number of areas. I cannot develop that, um, but there are many acts in areas such as um, international aviation, the environment, fisheries, human health, and so on, where there is ample legislation of the EU that uh, expressly uh, refers to um, international law, either in the preamble or even in the operational parts of um, the EU Act. There is, of course, another uh, rich area of, um, let's say, EU active, uh, active legislation that, that uh, is constantly in interaction with international law, and these are the external relations linked acts of the EU think, for example, of the blocking statute that the or, uh, regulation of the EU from 1996 that has been revised a couple of years ago, initially a reaction to the uh, helms burton Act of the United States, and later on uh, further developed because of, yes, the Trump administration 
and its uh, legislation against uh, Iran. Now, uh, that regulation explicitly in its preamble um, uh, states that, and I quote, uh, uh, by their extraterritorial application, such laws, regulations, and other legislative instruments violate international law and impede the attainment of um, the uh, objectives of the EU. Now, so um, it's clear that the legislator of the EU in those areas, also, for instance, in the area of restrictive measures eh, and all the other sanctions tools that have been developed uh, more recently, such as the anti-coercion instrument, such as the uh, so-called the Magnitsky Act, eh, to sanction uh, 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 persons who violate human rights in the world, um, that all of these instruments are, of course, in a very uh, important um, extent, uh, referring to violations of international law and the EU um, say, uh, autonomous acts as uh, responses to those violations. So it's a rich field um, that requires a, a deeper analysis and where I think indeed uh, it shows that the EU legislator in a certain way presents itself as being quite responsive and receptive to international uh, law and uh, in, say, referring explicitly to, um, say, doctrines of customary <coughs> international uh, law. What explains this difference in attitude of the EU legislator and the European Court of Justice? It may have to do with uh, different roles that each of the institutions play, place, and the restrictive approach of the court can maybe be understood as um, a desire to protect the integrity and the autonomy of the EU legislators or, or, the, or, the, or the EU legal order, while much of the open attitude of the EU legislator to international law can probably be understood also in light of the desire of the political organs of the EU to present the Union as a responsible international actor who shapes uh, and wants to interact with the shaping of um, the legal developments uh, in international law. So in that sense, I think there is a bit of a contrast between the two, and I would hope in the final version of the paper that I can develop an argument to encourage the court um, to, to take a bit of a more open uh, stance vis-a-vis -vis, um, uh, international law in its, uh, in its future case law. Uh, not just to be more consistent with the EU legislature, but for the very obvious fact that indeed uh, Article 3, Paragraph 5 of the EU really shows um, that the EU constitution maker, the treaty, uh, has a very open attitude to what is called strict observance and development of international law. I'm going to stop here. Dear Marcel, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Jan. Uh, this is indeed underlines again how various actors can play a role in, 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 in the dealing with customary international law and with interpretation thereof. Uh, we heard about the space law and uh, the Artemis program and now how the EU plays a role. I think they are very relevant aspects to be dealt with as, a, as one of these challenges to uh, customary international law. Let's go immediately to our last speaker. Andreas Kulik, yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you to Panos and his team to, uh, for inviting me. Um, my presentation um, will be dealing with uh, interpreting the customary rules uh, on state responsibility. However, I will more take this as a general opportunity to, to think a little bit about um, how do we deal with the uh, appearance of certain texts that play a prominent role in practice when it comes to the interpretation uh, of customary international law. And um, the intention of this um, presentation of the paper that I'm writing from the outset has been to challenge and to uh, kind of contest certain notions. It's only that until, until I saw the the articles and the commentary uh, yesterday that I realized that I will throwing uh, quite some bombs uh, at, at, uh, um, at what has been said, but uh, as yesterday as well, this will always be done with love. Yeah? Um, so the specific um, um, 
impetus for me to, to think about these issues, as I said, is what is, um, how do we deal with having certain texts like the Arceva, for example, and the, and the commentary that uh, play a prominent role in, in interpretation, but of course <coughs> they themselves are not um, state practice and opinion use, but are, are created by, in the case of, um, of the Arceva and the commentary, by um, an organ of an international organization, or even a, a sub-organ of an international organization, but also other uh, texts that plays a role, if you think of the, um, um, we heard of the ICRC um, uh, rules, 2005 rules, and so on. So we have these texts, and how do we deal with them? How, how do we, um, can there be actually a way to um, argue that they have a certain um, authority and what role it, it plays. So it basically it goes to the issue of what has been um, addressed with the by proxy interpretation. Yeah? I mean, uh, not using that term, but, but this is kind of the, the issue that has been addressed in, in the articles. So Panos uh, yesterday in, in his presentation uh, you know, used uh, some allusion to um, Nightmare Before Christmas, and you might have found that a little bit uh, peculiar, uh, what I'm going to do now that you find even more peculiar, and it is intentionally so because, uh, as I said, it's, it's in, intended to uh, challenge and uh, to make us uh, think about certain issues. So my claim is, um, if we want to think about uh, custom and interpretation of customary international law, I find it instructive to think uh, of it as a kind of a combination of Wikipedia on the one hand and Eaton Mess on the other. I will uh, explain in a second what I mean by that. So my central the uh, thesis of this presentation are threefold. The first one is that um, custom consists of a, what I call complex textuality. We'll call it hypertext and I will explain in a second what, that, what I mean by that. <coughs> Excuse me. Second thesis is that because of that complex textuality, I think we have to uh, think of the methodology, the interpretive methodology of custom differently to treaty interpretation. And particularly so when it comes to um, the uh, rules on state responsibility. But I think uh, as, a, as a general principle. And for that reason, we need specific justifications for why we are using those by proxy texts, um, those uh, specific texts as uh, granting them certain authority when we're interpreting them, or interpreting custom, and using them for interpreting custom. So let me take a step back and think about what is the textuality? How do the text looks li look like when we interpret a treaty? And of course, we have the, um, the crucial approach that has been talked um, <coughs> uh, particularly about yesterday, but still we have a text that is in a way, the treaty text that is in, in a way the center of the starting point of interpretation, it, which I, what I mean by that is we have a clear ordering of the text. We know this is the treaty text. We have context. We have travaux. So we have an orientation of how these texts relate to each other, and we start um, with, uh, with the treaty text, and it's to some extent expressed in the methodology of Article 31. How is it about custom? Well, the interpretive material that we have at hand in custom, as you know, is we might have a treaty text that, uh, that is expressive of custom. We might have resolutions by international organizations. Think of the, <coughs> the Friendly uh, Relations Declaration, for example. We have statements of um, state officials that can be in written form, that can be in verbal form. We have physical action. Think of, for example, uh, a warship um, doing innocent passage uh, through the um, 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 territorial sea or, so, or something like that. This is e not even in verbal form. It's just in physical action. We have domestic legislation. We have domestic uh, court decisions. We have the ILC work. We have the other texts and so on. 
So all these different texts has, uh, have what I um, refer to as um, complex textuality. They can be individual state conduct, collective state conduct. They can be um, in written and unwritten form, verbal and nonverbal form. Um, they can be from the, uh, derived from the international level. They can derive from the domestic level, at least in, in the first place. And they can, to some extent, also derive from, from state or from uh, non-state actors. So the idea or the, the kind of offer that, that I want to make here in this presentation, and you might be wondering a little bit why am I in this panel, yeah? because state responsibility is not necessarily new developments. Uh, I think I, I'm representing probably more the approaches in the sense <coughs> that my offer to think new about these things, and you will see that what I, I uh, present to you is might be uh, quite unfamiliar to some extent, and, but this is ex exactly the point. My um, offer in the approach is to think of, um, to take an approach from media theory and, and literary theory um, of two concepts that I, I think are very instructive to think about custom when it comes to interp interpretive issues. And these are intertext and hypertext. So the term of intertextuality is something that is very much used in um, literary and in media studies, can denote various different things, but on a very basic level, it means that texts are interconnected. And you need to um, read one text in the context of, uh, in connection with another text uh, to understand it. What, what does it mean, for example? So for example, James Joyce Ulysses, you can only understand it if you read it in the context with uh, um, Homer's Odyssey in mind. Or even when we're, when we're not talking about verbal form, uh, think of paintings that refer to other paintings, like, for example, Andy Warhol's versions of Edward Munch's uh, Self-Portrait and Madonna. Uh, an advanced version of intertextuality is um, <coughs> what we call hypertext. In the internet, we have uh, the linking of various different texts in a broader sense, so semiotic signs. can be written text, can be videos, it can be um, uh, pictures, uh, whatnot. And what is specific about it is that you don't have a fixed starting point where to read, not a fixed ending point where to read. Think of, and that is the first example, think of Wikipedia. Of course, you can search. Of course, Wikipedia in itself doesn't have a starting point to read. Connects different texts, yeah, links it to each other. <coughs> has a variable structure that you can change. And that is interactive also to, to the extent that the readers can, by certain rules, also contribute to it. And the variability of the structure goes even so far that it does not have to be linear, but it can be linear. You can add a tree structure, you can add a network structure, you can add a, an axis, you can combine them, but it doesn't have a fixed center. And I invite you to think of custom in an analogy to hypertext to that form, because <coughs> we don't have a text that has um, is centered as, as much as a treaty text is when, when, when we come, uh, think of treaty interpretation, which then is reflected to some extent also in Article 31 and 32. We also have a very variable structure because the way the different texts, the different expression, the different inter interpretive material of custom is related to each other is much more complex. But we can add certain relations, certain hierarchies, certain, give certain importance to, to certain texts. And I said Wikipedia is one way to, to think about it because that adds certain hierarchies and certain inter, interrelations as well. But another way where I would invite you to, to think of, um, kind of take an inspiration is the very delicious um, dessert, English dessert of Eaton Mess. 
What is it? It is a combination of strawberries, whipped cream, and broken meringue. But what is special about it is that you still can see its individual components, but the combination of it creates something new. And this is how I um, would invite us to think about uh, approach and methodology of thinking uh, how, how we interpret um, customary international law, and particularly when it comes to certain specific texts that assert certain hierarchies. Because this Eaton mess in us yeah, can uh, make us think of micro rules and meta rules. So if we have a certain text, certain uh, interpretive materials, like, for example, a treaty text, like a unilateral act, like um, domestic legislation, I think the way we, we should approach it is we uh, interpret it according to the rules that are, are applicable to it. A treaty has to be interpreted according to the uh, rules of treaty interpretation. Unilateral acts according to those acts. Domestic legislation according to the domestic uh, rules of statutory interpretation. But of course, that doesn't help us that much if we have a variety of, um, or at least helps us in the first step, but doesn't help us um, about the relationship of, uh, of these materials. And therefore, I think we also have to think of meta rules that give a certain weighing of these different materials. And this is what I want to in invite you to think about in the brief time that I still have when it comes to particularly texts like um, the Arceva and the commentary. <coughs> because as I said, custom has a specific variable structure, but the um, variability also means that you can include certain focal points, certain hierarchical uh, structures that are, of course, not the same, uh, don't have the same centeredness as a treaty text when it comes to treaty interpretation, but still uh, play an important role. And I think what um, we can identify here as, um, as certain uh, ways to, to assert that is uh, what I refer to as vetting processes. So certain criteria that um, you can look at in order to, to see to what extent these texts um, have a certain higher authority, um, a justification for, for that authority. And I would say um, one very important aspect of it, and this is a limited uh, voluntarist link, as, as I call it, is the opportunity of states in particular to comment on the process to be involved in that process. And if you, if you think about, for example, how, how ILC articles are created, this is exactly how it is done. But of course, another um, um, criterion can also be, and that might even go beyond you know, the, uh, the ILC, is the expertise of a body, and particularly that states regard this uh, body as a certain, as having certain expertise. Think of the R, uh, ICRC, for example. Um, also, representativeness is a criterion. I think in that regard. So um, I think this, in this combination of um, micro rules and meta rules, I think this is um, a way to um, maybe think about, make sense of these texts that have certain, uh, a cert a certain authority. And if you look into the practice of <coughs> international courts and tribunals, how the ICJ is dealing with it, how investment tribunals are dealing with it, how other um, international courts and tribunals are dealing with for example, uh, the Arceva, I think you see um, some aspects of, of it reflected. The final takeaway that, that I um, want to give from, from that uh, presentation is I hope it has um, challenged, disturbed, maybe irritated to some extent. Um, this was exactly the intention of it because I think we um, just um, more or less making an analogies to the way we think about treaty interpretation, in my opinion, is because of the material that we have in custom interpretation, that it's so different to treaty interpretation, I think, uh, in my opinion, does not work. But still, we have to make, um, we, we have to think about how we deal with these texts that may, might, might look like a treaty text, but still are not treaties play uh, a prominent role in interpretation, but still don't work like in treaty interpretation. Thank you very much. I'm very much looking forward to the, the discussion.
Thank you very much, uh, Andreas, and also for sticking to the time, because we are already in the coffee break, and I don't know, I have just a look at the organizers, whether we have time for a Q&A or a two, three two minutes? minutes, so a few questions. Fifteen minutes. The break will be short. The break will be short, so, uh, but I think it is worthwhile to ask a number of questions, and certainly the, on the last topic, I don't think it's so much irritating. It was challenging and also stimulating to think a bit along these lines. I see Nina's hand. How many other hands do you see here? Georgia's, you can also come here if you wish uh, for answering questions to you. Um, I go to Nina first, and then... Uh, Thank you very much, uh, Marcel, and thank you to all the panelists. It was a phenomenal panel. I greatly enjoyed it. Uh, I have two questions, one for Dr. Kiriakopoulos and uh, one for uh, Dr. Kulek. I begin with the one to Dr. Kiriakopoulos. Thank you. It was a very interesting presentation for someone as myself who is a novice in space law, and it made me think about ways to sort of counter some of these worrying trends that you out outlined. So my question to you is, if we consider the earlier rules on the non-appropriation of space as customary rules. And then we consider instances like the Artemis Accord as subsequent practice in relation to these rules. Do you see any potential for interpretation to counter some of this problematic practice? So do you see the potential for customary law interpretation to be used in a manner, in a strategic manner, either by states who disagree with the emergent subsequent practice or other actors who disagree with this emergent subsequent practice of appropriation? to use then interpretive arguments in domestic or international dispute fora to counter this practice. And then my second question to Dr. Kulek, um, it's, it's more a question of clarification. Um, you talked about custom as hypertext, and I really enjoyed this reference also to literature. It was very illustrative. But I wanted to ask you, when you speak of custom as hypertext, does this refer to the relationship uh, between different customary rules? So do you speak of uh, this decentered variable structure as between customary rules? Or do you speak more of the relationship within a customary rule and then between the elements of a customary rule? Because I think this has a bearing then on how we read your conclusions. Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. Um, what do we have with respect to Article 2? We have uh, a long-established principle, both at the customary level and at the conventional level, about non-appropriation. In fact, this is, I mean, up to, up to now, I mean, there were no, no objections on that. Uh, we have no state practice that have violated the rule, which is really important. So, and now the Artemis Accords, what is it in fact? Uh, it is a state interpretation. States as subjects of international law have the right to interpret law. And what they have said, simply that exploiting space resources is not appropriation. That's all. So of course states, because they're sovereign, they can say whatever they want. But we know that an interpretation, both of conventional rules and customary rules done by states, bind also these states. So what is needed in order for this uh, uh, interpretation that takes place inside the Artemis Accords is more states. And this is what the United States try to do now, to make more states agree on that, conclude the Artemis Accords. Because you understand that today's 83 states, it's a very small number in comparison with the 193 states that are the members of the United Nations. Uh, if, after five years, I make a hypothesis, a scenario, if uh, more than 80 states have signed the Artemis Accords, this sound, this can change things, because uh, uh, this would mean that a, a, a great part of this international space community agrees in a specific interpretation of Article 2. For the moment, we don't have a, a counter movement. Uh, the only thing we have is that most states uh, uh, remain the traditional interpretation of Article 2. So it's something that we will see in the future, whether it can be provocative, challenging, or it would stay in a very low level. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for this uh, question. Um, well. 
I was talking about the interpretive material when it comes to a specific rule, so within the, the rule. I mean, of course, um, any texts have, you know, this, I mean, the, the theory of intertextuality, you can apply that to, to anything. And of course, in this very broad way that it's used, uh, I don't find it, or I found, didn't find it particularly helpful because, of, I mean, of course, also when it comes to treaty, there is intertextuality, for example, in uh, 313C. I mean, it's specific, you know, referring to, to other texts. But uh, my point was to think about um, what makes um, a customary rule in itself and the, uh, the material that we have when we interpret it uh, quite different to um, how we interpret a treaty, in my opinion at least. And I think this um, structure uh, that, that works quite differently, how the texts, yeah, in a broader sense, are connected, the interpretive material are connected. Thank you. And then I noted that, George, you had a no, question. Huh? No, no, I do not respond. I'm asking. You were asking. Yes, sir. I just wanted to give you the floor to yes. ask for an intra um, discussion. Yeah. It is a question for, for Andreas. Uh, yes. We really thank you for this. I mean, provocative in the good sense presentation. Uh, I would like to ask you, do you think that uh, the ARCIVA rules, the ALC articles, uh, constitute an object of interpretation or more or less it is a broad interpretative exercise of the customary law on state responsibility. Yeah, uh, I think this, I mean, this goes very much to the heart of um, what I wanted to address in, in, in that talk, because I think when we, <coughs> when we look at the practice of international courts and tribunals, for example, uh, um, the ICJ may be a little less, um, in the area that, that I work in a lot, investment arbitration enormously, yeah? um, we have um, the reference to uh, the Arceva and the commentary to a limit, more limited extent as more or less exclusively the only thing that is being, being looked at, right? Um, and that has always been, uh, that has always disturbed me that it, the way um, international courts and tribunals are going about that, because it looks to me very much that um, what they are doing is a bastardized version of, of Article 31, 32 of ECLT. Yeah, that they're basically treating as a, as a de facto uh, treaty. And um, what I wanted to address in, in uh, that talk was that on the one hand, I think that cannot uh, in any way work. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense to me, yeah, um, because clearly it's not a treaty. Yeah. Um, but on the other hand, that I think we also cannot uh, just pretend, well, we are just um, doing, uh, looking at um, state practice and, and opinion yours and just pretending that either, either those texts do not exist or at least don't play a, an important role. I think they are, uh, ha are very prominent and play, uh, play an enormous role, but how can we make sense of that? And, um, and therefore, I um, introduce these uh, issues of you know focal points that um, play a prominent role, but still you have a rebuttable presumption when you look at state practice and opinion use that might deviate from it or might change it. Yeah, but at least as a starting point, this is what you look at. You can rebut it, but uh, it plays a, um, a, pro a very prominent role. And I try to create you know some argumentation of how um, we can uh, uh, put those focal points in, even though they're not. Um, treaty. So I didn't have time to go into detail of uh, how we would then, you know, create the methodology in their relationship. And I just want to say in that regard, I think um, it's also there it doesn't make sense to think, for example, of the um, Arceva as equivalent to the text and the commentary as kind of the travaux. Yeah? I think they, they should be more or less on the same level and the way uh, international courts are tra uh, and tribunals are treating them, that is ac actually what they are doing. Thank you. This is the last opportunity to, for a last question. Panos, oh, two last questions. There's nothing on the chat. No. Panos and, uh, and the Soterios, of course, also. Oh, oh, Mangosha, sorry, I overlooked you. Uh, uh, first, Mangosha uh, in the front, Ms. Morris. Yeah.
I have a very short question to Andreas. It was very interesting, something very different. Um, how do you select focal point? How do you, which I understood is the starting of the process, right? The focal point. Uh, maybe I misunderstood, but if you could uh, maybe say something about it, the selection of focal point and whether it's really the start of the whole procedure. Thank you. Let's first take the other questions as well before yeah, yeah, answering sure. them. Yes, Sotirius? Actually, my question is, is quite relevant to what has been said uh, about focal points. Essentially, what exactly is the difference between choosing a focal point and actually rendering this focal point an object of interpretation? And then I, I can see here there are meta rules which relate to the selection of the focal point. But uh, again, this is the follow-up. What then? Like, what if you choose that the focal point is Article 38 of the RC world, like uh, on interest, and then you need to apply it in a situation, decide whether you need simple or compound interest? Panos, do you still want to ask your question? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, sorry, there were some technical issues <laughs> being to uh, be taken care of. Um, so thank you all for the uh, very interesting presentations. Uh, I have a number of questions. I'll try to be very brief. Uh, to Dr. Kiriakopoulos, um, one question that I would have is, for instance, could this be also the, uh, because you've, you wrapped up with the suggestion that these interpretations basically um, may end up kind of doing away with the rules of customary international law uh, as, as we know them, that maybe this could be potentially an example of a limit, that basically you render the rules ineffective uh, with this particular approach that states are taking? Or do you think that this is right on the edge uh, where a state could plausibly make these interpretations and get away with it? Um, to Professor Bouters, if he's still uh, online, uh, uh, yes, I, I would be the first to, to applaud and support, cheer on uh, the <laughs> European Union and the Court of Justice uh, engaging uh, more with customer international law. But my question is, um, do you think that this is really the case, that uh, the courts is really uh, or is willing, actually, to engage more and more with customer international law? Or will there be always the classical pushback that we are the EU has its own legal order and therefore all the judgments will continuously focus uh, on EU law. And finally to, to Andreas, Andreas, we've worked together on many occasions, we've, we've even written articles together and the loving bombs are part of the process. Uh, all, of course, uh, taken in, in the best possible manner and to prove the, uh, uh, the end result. Uh, so this was a very interesting presentation. One thing that I would also like to challenge you, uh, in a previous one where you had a wonderful uh, slide with uh, the possible structures uh, of uh, customer international law, um, my possible objection there would be that um, I would also think that with respect to treaty rules, uh, the same variable structure uh, would apply. That yes, you have a text that, as mathematicians would, would say, functions as an attractor, uh, but that is not the rule as such, that it is simply, uh, you know, uh, in, in, in the, the book Flatland, it will be described as a, as a 3D object trying to be described to 2D entities, basically. So it is a slice of a, a more space-time worm uh, there that you're trying to see. And therefore, the variability that you say exists in customer international law, and I agree, it exists in much more intense levels, also is there because then, as you said, you have 313C, you have the subsequent practice, and the rule basically exists in a kind of quantum level of uncertainty until it is actually applied. So that will be my, my loving bomb as well. Thank you very much. We don't have much time. I first will check with Conrad whether Professor Wouters is still online. He's not online, so then he cannot answer the question. Then I would like first to give you the floor okay. for the question posed to you. <coughs> Thank you, Panos, for your question. Uh, the fact is that Article 2 and its customary um, 
um, ego is, has become annoying for developing states, for some developing states that uh, would like to, to harvest space resources uh, without any problem. Uh, and the problem with the rule is that the rule is very clear. So before the Artemis Accords, there have been attempts uh, of interpreting Article 2 in a way that uh, could permit the exploitation of space resources. All of them were unsuccessful. For instance, uh, um, an argument was advanced that um, states have the right to, to exploit space resources, as states have the right to fish on the high seas. But of course, we have a specific issue in UNCLOS for fishing on the high seas, so we have, a, we have a rule. There was before customary, and now it's also conventional and very clear. Uh, this is not the case with space resources. So as a last resort, what uh, they have thought is that maybe if they provide the interpretation, political one, with no legal stance, that for us, states, uh, going up there and dig and take the resources is not appropriation. It is the last solution. The next solution is to amend the treaties, to amend the law. But the space environment is not favorable to that. So this is the case. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I've been told to be brief. I don't want to deprive you of your, uh, your coffee, so, so very briefly. Uh, take panel's uh, uh, question um, first. Yes, of course, as I, as I said, you can apply you know, this intertextuality uh, approach also to, to treaties. But I think what is specific about hypertext yeah, in, in the way I explained it is you don't have uh, a point to start reading. And uh, with treaty inter interpretation, it is different. You have the treaty text as the starting point that tells you something about um, um, the, the ordinary meaning of the text, yeah, that you start, the, um, the telos, the context, and also the way other texts relate to it. Yeah? We know then what is travaux, at least to some extent. We know, we know yeah, but at least we know um, um, what relates to what. Where, where, um, whereas in, uh, um, in custom, what is the travaux of, uh, of a customer? What is the context of a customary rule and so on? So, um, so I think it, it works quite differently in that regard. Um, and I take uh, uh, Malgoja's and Soteria's uh, question together because, I mean, they, they, they relate to each other. So um, yes, I would say um, in my paper, I kind of put out a more detailed uh, methodology uh, suggestion uh, in that way. Uh, we should first ask the question, uh, do we have focal points? And the way to determine a focal point is exactly what I, what I tried to do here with, uh, with those vetting processes. I think this is a, um, a way to determine that. Then um, we look into if we have those uh, focal points to what kind of are the micro rules of, of interpreting them. If, if the focal point is a treaty, treaty interpretation. Yeah? And then we also ask, uh, as a final question, uh, is the presumption to be rebutted or not? Yeah? So uh, do we have other materials that really uh, deviates from that to, to a certain extent that we then also interpret according to uh, the micro rules. So, so that would be kind of the methodology and also to some extent the uh, short answer to what happens next. Okay, we have to leave it at this and we are really uh, wanting to have some coffee. Let me thank again all the panelists, Jan Wouters at home, Patricia in Lisbon, Georges and uh, Andreas.